Hey there, friends. Winds of winter spoilers are ahead. Greetings. It is Monday afternoon or maybe Monday evening here in the, uh, well, I guess it's Monday everywhere right now. So I am on the West Coast of America. You may be somewhere else. You may be on the East Coast. You may be in Europe. You may be in Australia. You may be in Japan or Taiwan. Who knows? Greetings. We're here to talk about Winds of Winter. It is the next in our series of Winds of Winter chapter readings interspersed with commentary. And today it is Tyrion 1. So we've started off with the Forsaken and Barristan and Victorioni. Um, if you don't get the joke, watch the Victorian 1 uh, <laughs> stream. But basically, we've been working on the Marine side of things, on the Eastern side of things. And that's going to go full bore today. Today, we are going to dive right into the battle. So think back especially to the Victorian, I'm sorry, the Barristan chapter, where Barristan is getting ready to lead this attack out into the field. It's a little bit desperate, but it looks like a good move because the Yunkish are a fragmented alliance. And they're sort of, they've got like no no uh, no options uh, because they're flinging the corpses into the city. And so now Marine is dealing with the plague and, and they can't just hunker down such as in a normal siege. Um, they also have very few allies outside the city, of course, until Victorio and he rolls up with his, with his great joy fleet. Um, but Barristan's attack is going gonna, is gonna to be one thing. But Tyrion, of course, has been working with the Second Sons. Now, the last Tyrion chapter of A Dance with Dragons, which is an awesome chapter, he's playing chess with the Second Sons, and he's essentially making a deal. He's signing over all the wealth of Casterly Rock, basically, to the Second Sons and Brown Ben Plum, and they're going to switch sides to Danny's side. And mainly, he does this by convincing Brown Ben that Danny's side is going to be the winning side. That's kind of the thing here. So, what looked like a dire situation for the for Danny's faction in Marine is shifting over to be a little bit more favorable. And this chapter is going to dive right into the action. So definitely going to be an, a battle action scene chapter. That's why I picked that picture of Tyrion that I did for the cover image. Let me just pull it up, give the artist some cred. This is from his battle, um, looks like on the Bridge of Ships, perhaps. That's by Jason Engel. Uh, but because of the orange and yellow hues, it almost looks like a desert scene. So it kind of fit the vibe. And I went with that. There wasn't exactly an artwork from, from this kind of, you know, Tyrion in the battle outside Marine. So you can see it looks like there's water in the background. He's on a ship. So this is definitely a bridge of ships scene um, from the Battle of the Blackwater. However, the nice orange hues kind of make you think of Marine a little bit in the sand. So cool picture of Tyrion too. It's a little bit more almost like a Lord of the Rings kind of dwarf, <laughs> but uh, pretty cool. It's got the ax, looks like a nasty bloke. I saw another piece of art with Tyrion in battle armor and he really looked like Sun Wukong, the monkey demon king from which Tyrion uh, draws his monkey demon nickname. So we could see some cool Sun Wukong action if, uh, Tyrion gets some like real fancy dragon armor from Daenerys before the end because Sun Wukong, of course, even though he's a monkey demon king, he loves dragon stuff and he steals dragon armor and dragon weapons in all of his stories. Uh, so Tyrion with some some dragon armor from Daenerys would be very Sun Wukong. I expect to see that coming. In any case, friends, you can insert your own comments and questions into the Tyrion stream here with the PayPal.me Mythical Astronomy or with the super chat function within YouTube. Of course, it will make the program better if your questions and comments are A, about Tyrion, and B, about, you know, stuff going on in the chapter. So I trust you all to help uh, to help provide the content here. And then real quick, let me just get my email pulled up so I can see when people send me PayPal. Oh, cool. It's doing that thing where it just hides the windows for no reason. All right, cool. All right, there we go. Here we are. Okay. 
we're ready to get started. So once once again, as always, we're paying attention to the first sentence. Sorry, let me just get my windows sorted here. So I can read good like I came from the Derek Zoolander school for kids who can't read good. Because you know I can read good. I can write good. Can't type good. Typing's a little sketch, but uh, we get there eventually. Okay, so Tyrion 1. Somewhere off in the far distance, a dying man was screaming for his mother. To horse, a man was yelling in Giscari in the next camp to the north of the Second Sons. To horse, to horse. High and shrill, his voice carried a long way in the morning air, far beyond his own encampment. Tyrion knew just enough Giscari to understand the words, but the fear in his voice would have been plain in any tongue. I know how he feels. So first paragraph, first sentence, we are, uh, <laughs> what is this? A live chat for ants? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. Uh, of course, there are a couple of scenes when George uses the ant symbolism, such as when Sansa is up in the veil at the end of Feast. Uh, she imagines the Lord's declarant like little ants at the bottom of the mountain. And uh, Danny makes that comparison when she's on top of the pyramid too, I believe. And then of course, Danny also crushes the ants when they come over the little brick wall and try to kill her like the others at the end of Dance with Dragons. We talked about that foreshadowing a bunch of times. So first sentence, somewhere off in the far distance, a dying man was screaming for his mother. So there's a couple of things here. Obviously it's setting the tone for a scene of battle. It complements the Barristan speech to his, uh, his young knights about how the battle goes and you may shit yourself and you'll cry for your mother and your father, but just keep going and keep fighting and maybe you'll live because lots of people do. Um, so we can see the same thing here. The fear is, you know, the confusion is starting to spread through the camps and it begins with a dying man screaming for his mother. Of course, we're also looking for Daenerys who is the Misa, the mother goddess. We're waiting for her to return to Meereen. So there's a little bit of an extra layer of like, we're looking for an answer that isn't here. We're looking for the mother's presence that isn't here. You could also think of the mother of Westeros of the seven, you know, she's associated with mercy. So there might not be a lot of that going on here, right? <clears throat> it was time to find his own horse, he knew. Time to don some dead boy's armor, buckle on a sword and dagger, slip his dinted great helm down over his head. Dawn had broken, and a sliver of the rising sun was visible visible behind the city's walls and towers, blindingly bright. To the west, the stars were fading, one by one. Trumpets were blowing along the Skahazadan, war horns answering from the walls of Mirin. A ship was sinking in the river mouth, a fire. Dead men and dragons were moving through the sky, whilst warships crashed and clashed on Slaver's Bay. That was a cool line. Dead men and dragons were moving through the sky. And of course, the dead men moving through the sky are the plague-ridden corpses that are being catapulted into the scene or into the city of Mirene. Uh, but the scene is certainly sounds like some mythical astronomy too. Um, the meteors, obviously, dragons and flaming swords are the obvious symbols that it, that everyone knows. But they also are like corpses or like even like dead children, um, because of course they're the children of the moon but they're like, they're sacrificed. They're kind of like the deformed dragon babies or Danny's Rago sacrificed to wake the dragons. There's a lot of undead symbolism with the moon meteors. Also the Night's Watch in some ways are analogous to the moon meteors, the black shadows and all that stuff. So dead men and dragons moving through the sky, definitely some long night language. And of course we saw dawn blinding bright and the idea that dawn had broken can Dawn the sword be broken? Is that important somehow? I don't know. We'll have to find out. But there it is. We got some deep throated war horns. So it says, uh, oh, the flaming ship, too. Nice green seer symbol there. I'm not sure if that'll be built on, but of course we know that. So Tyrion could not see them from here, but he could hear the sounds the crash of hull against hull as ships slammed together, the deep throated war horns of the Ironborn and the queer high whistles of Karth, the splintering of oars the shouts and battle cries, the crash of axe on armor, sword on shield, all mingled with the shrieks of wounded men. Many of the ships were still far out in the bay, so the sounds they made seemed faint and far away, but he knew them all the same. 
the music of slaughter. So the Song of Ice and Fire is taking a dark, dark turn here. <clears throat> yes, deep-throated warhorns. Um, look, what you do with your warhorn in the privacy of your own home is, uh, is between you and God. So... I, however, will not try to swallow the uh, the bull's horn that's on my shelf. Do with that what you will. In order to sound it, I'd have to chop the end off, uh, which uh, it's really not necessary when you think about it. It's an old practice, uh, not necessary anymore. Um, in any case, it's more of a drinking horn than a sounding horn. But I digress. <laughs> Okay, the chat's going to be gone for like 10 minutes now. Okay, so the music of slaughter is happening. 300 yards from where he stood rose the wicked sister, her long arms swinging up with a clutch of corpses. Chunk, thump! And there they flew, naked and swollen, pale dead birds tumbling boneless through the air. George definitely loves describing macabre things, doesn't he? Swollen, pale dead birds tumbling boneless through the air. Oh, God, that just sounds so nasty. The siege camps shimmered in a gaudy haze of rose and gold, but the famous stepped pyramids of Marine hulked back, uh, excuse me, hulked black against the glare. So they're silhouetted against the rising sun. Something was moving atop one of them, he saw. A dragon, but which one? At this distance, it could, is, it could have as easily been an eagle, a very big eagle. <laughs> After days spent hidden inside musty tents of the second suns, the outside air smelled fresh and clear. Though we could not see the bay from where he stood, the tang of salt told him it was near. Tyrion filled his lungs with it. A fine day for battle. From the east, the sound of drumming rolled across the parched plain. A column of mounted men flashed past Harridan, flying the blue banners of the wind blown. So here we see the catapults. And we know that Barristan's armor was uh, making for the catapults, right? Like that was their... That was their objective. So we know that the catapults is about to be a central scene in the uh, in the battle here. So it says a younger man might have found it all exhilarating. A stupider man might have thought it grand and glorious right up to the moment when some arse, ug arse ugly, yunkish slave soldier with rings in his nipples planted an ax between his eyes. Guys, if you can't write like this, you're not ready to, to write books. What can I say? <laughs> right up to the moment when some arse, ugly, yunkish slave soldier with rings in his nipples planted an axe between his eyes. When George thought of that first scene of the direwolves in the snow, <laughs> did he know it was going to lead to arse, ugly, yunkish slave soldiers with nipple rings? Um, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? He's a gardener after all. Tyrion Lannister knew better. The gods did not fashion me to wield a sword, he thought. So why do they keep putting me in the midst of battles? No one heard. No one cared. No one answered. Tyrion found himself thinking back on his first battle. Oh, and by the way, I did. Uh, let me give you, sorry, the link to this text in case anybody wants to read along. Very bad of me. Of course, you can Google search anything. Hopefully, you guys know how to use Google now um, here in the year of 2021. Uh, but there it is. Uh, Tyrion Winds of Winter sample chapter. You can pull it up if you want to read along. So Tyrion knows that uh, this is not sweet or glorious, right? And of course, when we talk about war in A Song of Ice and Fire, obviously, George is very caught up in showing the cost of war. I mean, A Feast for Crows makes that abundantly clear. Um, so George, he does kind of see the glory of war, too. He does give us those moments of battle lust, battle glory, battle greatness, um, heroism and stuff. Uh, but he, he just it always wants to show both sides of it. So, you know, this is definitely a place where heroes will be born. However, Yunkish, not Yunkish. I don't know. I kind of like Yunkish. So there you go. Um, yeah, Yunkish sounds weird, but... Of course, the Yunkai name sound, the Miranese name sound weird too. In any case, that's just very evident in the scene. Uh, and George is even ridiculing the people who find it only glorious. He's like, yeah, a young foolish people or an idiot might think that this is glorious, but really what this is about is straight horror, right? Let's 
San Francisco. Oh, it's on both sides. I don't have to turn it. Okay. So Tyrion found himself thinking back on his first battle. Shay had been the first to stir, woken by his father's trumpets, the sweet strumpet who'd pleasured him for half the... Of course he's got to put strumpet right after trumpet. What is this? Like, <laughs> Dr. Seuss? Shay had been the first to stir, woken by his father's trumpets, the sweet strumpet who'd pleasured him for half the night, had trembled naked in his arms, a frightened child. Or was that all a lie as well, a ploy she used to make me feel brave and brilliant? What a mummer she might have been, or she might have been. Yeah, so Tyrion is slowly figuring out. Oh, Tyrion. Okay, when Tyrion had shouted out for Podrick Payne to help him with his armor, he'd found the boy asleep and snoring. Not the quickest lad I've ever known, but a decent squire in the end. I hope he found a better man to serve. That's a funny line, because of course he's serving Brienne, and Pod can't decide whether to call Brienne sir or milady or whatever. So it's it's kind of funny there. It was queer, but Tyrion remembered the green fork much better than the black water. It was my first. You never forget your first. He remembered the fog drifting off the river, wending through the reeds like pale white fingers. And the beauty of that sunrise, he remembered that as well. Stars strewn across a purple sky, the grass glittering like glass with the morning dew, red splendor in the east. He remembered the touch of Shay's fingers as she helped Pod with Tyrion's mismatched armor. That bloody helm, like a bucket with a spike. That spike had saved him, though, had won him his first victory. But Grote and Penny had never looked half as silly as he must have looked that day. Uh, Shay had called him fearsome when she saw him in his steel, mind you. How could I have been so blind, so deaf, so stupid? I should have known better than to do my thinking with my cock. So again, Tyrion is just now figuring out that he was paying Shay <laughs> to be nice to him. Anyways, the second sons were saddling their horses. Oh, real quick. Thank you from Janeska. Been listening to the content. Oh, been binging. All right. Oh, road trip. That's awesome. Yeah, I've road tripped across the U.S. a couple of times. You definitely need content. So I'm glad that's working out for you. So we've got, let's see here. Actually, let me check my PayPal's in case somebody has like a super topical comment that I'm running past. So Alan says, Tyrion has hands down the most fun to read chapters. No burning questions other than why couldn't the show bring more darkness to him and not be a midget Jack Sparrow? P.S. What is your favorite song off of Ohms? Your shirt matches the album cover. Oh, it sure does. Yeah, I saw that comment. Ohms being the new Deftones album. Uh, oh, God. The problem is I can't remember the names of them yet. Let's see. Uh, Deftones, Ohms, Playlist. Uh, the Shape of the s s Mathematics, the Spell of Mathematics, I think. Um, and Ohms itself is awesome. Uh, yeah, there you go. There's enough Deftones talk, but yeah, listen to Deftones. And this is just an Adidas shirt with a super cool 70s. There's a, what's the name of this? There's a name for this pattern. I don't know those words, but somebody knows it. And the second, there was one more PayPal. That one was from Matthew, who says, for the long bottom leaf fund, just a thought, looking forward to Tyrion and Victorian in conversation, comedy gold. So the comedy gold goes beyond Tyrion and Victorian. It's going to be Tyrion and Victorian and Barristan, all three. <laughs> it's going to be really funny because like Victorian is really dumb. Barristan is kind of dumb and Tyrion is really smart, but a little bit blind sometimes. So yes, uh, that's right. Adidas. Sorry. I, I, the, Adidas is the wrong pronunciation as we learned uh, a couple weeks ago on this show. Uh, it's only we Americans who say Adidas. The rest of the world says Adidas because they're named after a guy who invented the shoes called Adi Dossler. His name was actually, his first name was longer, but his nickname was Adi, A-D-I, and then Dossler. So Adidas. The, the shameful thing about this is that the Adidas website, formerly known as the Adidas website, uh, they do not correct us Americans because they know we are arrogant and don't like to be corrected. And so all of the Adidas advertising, they don't say the name of their company. They're humoring us, guys. It's pretty insulting, isn't it? They don't think we can handle the truth. What's up with that, Adidas? You don't think we can handle the truth? 
I mean, yes, I freaked out the first time someone told me. I did. I did freak out. But, yeah. Anyways, back to Tyrion. So, the second sons, they were saddling their horses. They went about it calmly, unhurried, efficiently. It was nothing... It was nothing they had not done a hundred times before. A few of them were passing a skin from hand to hand, though whether it was wine or water, you could not say. Bococo was kissing his lover shamelessly, kneading the boy's buttocks with one hand, the other tangled in his hair. Behind them, Sir Garibald was brushing out the mane of his big gelding. Kem sat on a rock, gazing at the ground, remembering his dead brother, perhaps, or dreaming of that friend back in King's Landing. Hammer and nail moved from man to man, checking spears and swords, adjusting armor, putting an edge on any blade that needed it. Snatch chewed his sour leaf, making japes and scratching at his balls with his hook hand. That sounds dangerous. <clears throat> Presumably he's wearing pants, so I guess it's not, you know, overly dangerous. Cool, we got some gay second sons, too. Second sons are down. So, Sir Bronn of the Blackwater now, unless my sisters killed him. Oh, I'm sorry, go back. Uh, Snatch, uh, scratching at his balls with his hook hand, something about his manner reminded Tyrion of Bronn. Sir Bronn of the Blackwater now, unless my sisters killed him. That might not be quite so simple as she thinks. He wondered how many battles these second sons had fought. How many skirmishes? How many raids? How many cities have they stormed? How many brothers have they buried or left behind to rot? Compared to them, Tyrion was a green boy, still untested, though we had counted more years than half the company. This would be his third battle. Seasoned and blooded, stamped and sealed, a proven warrior, that's me. I've killed some men and wounded others, taken wounds myself and lived to tell of them. I've led charges, heard men scream my name, cut down bigger men and better, even had a few small tastes of glory. And wasn't that a fine, rich wine for heroes, and wouldn't I like another taste? Yet with all he'd done and all he'd seen, the prospect of another battle made his blood, run, his blood run cold. He had traveled across half the world by way of palanquin, pole boat, and pig. George does love his alliteration. Sailed in slave ships. Hold on, we gotta rewind that. Rewind! <laughs> he had traveled across half the world by way of palanquin, pole boat, and pig. Sailed in slave ships and trading galleys. Mounted whores and horses, all the time telling himself that he did not care whether he lived or died, only to find that he cared quite a lot after all. <clears throat> the stranger had mounted his pale mare and was riding toward them with his sword in hand, but Tyrion Lannister did not care to meet with him again. Not now, not yet, not this day. What a fraud you are, Imp. You let a hundred guardsmen rape your wife, shot your father through the belly with a quarrel, twisted a golden chain around your lover's throat until her face turned black, yet somehow you still think that you deserve to live. So here's, in response to, uh, to um, Alan Thompson's PayPal about why didn't the show go darker with Tyrion, that paragraph right there is a great encapsulation of it, isn't it? Uh, he's, you know, he's recounting his sins and he's mocking the idea that he even deserves to live. So this shows you that Tyrion... It's not only hit a dark spot, but he's he's aware of it too. So um looks like I missed a super chat. Let me go back. Oh, yeah, I got Janeska's. So it is this one from E. Marty. He says, Can you focus on Tyrion getting angry with Penny? Tyrion snaps out of a random berserk rage at about the same time the dragons start moving. Is that a Targaryen reference or just interesting writing? Does that happen in this chapter or the previous one? I can't remember. I think it's in this chapter. So let's wait until we get there and We'll discuss Penny. <clears throat> oh, next chat, <laughs> next paragraph. Penny was already in her armor when Tyrion slipped back inside the tent they shared. She had been strapping herself into the wooden plate for years in service to her mummery. Real plate and mail were not so different once you mastered all the clasps and buckles. And if the company steel was dented here and rusted there, scratched and stained and discolored, no matter. It should still be good enough to stop a sword. The only piece she had not donned was her helm. When he entered, she looked up. You're not armored. You're not armored. What's happening? The usual things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Flip that around. When, she ent when he entered, she looked up. You're not armored. What's happening? 
the usual things, mud and blood and heroism, killing and dying. There's only one battle being fought out on the bay. There's one battle being fought out on the bay, another one beneath the city walls. Whichever way the Yunkish turn, they have a foe behind them. The closest fighting's a good league off still, but we'll be in it soon, on one side or the other. The Second Sons were ripe for another change of masters. Tyrion was almost certain of that, though there was a great abyss between certain and almost certain. If I have misjudged my man, all of us are lost. Put on your helm and make sure the clasps are closed. I took mine off once to keep from drowning, and it cost me a nose. Tyrion picked at his scar. <clears throat> we need to get you into your armor first, if you wish. The jerkin first, the boiled leather with the iron studs. Ring mail over that, then the gorget. He glanced about the tent. Is there wine? No. We had half a flagon left from supper. A quarter of a flagon, and you drank it, he sighed. I would sell my sister for a cup of wine. You would sell your sister for a cup of horse piss. That was so unexpected it made him laugh aloud. Is my taste for horse piss so well known, or have you met my sister? So yeah, props for Penny here. Penny's Penny's gaining some confidence. She's dropping some she's dropping some good lines there. That's good. And of course, I guess it was last chapter that Tyrion sort of slapped some sense into her, if if you will. I'm sorry, it doesn't sound good, but essentially Penny was panicking on the eve of the battle. And Tyrion was essentially grabbed her and I guess I think he slapped her and was just like, hey, we're about to die. Put on your armor. Take a deep breath. Follow me. We got to do this. Um, kind of worked. Obviously, you shouldn't slap people. Uh, but, you know, there's uh, the comment was in regards to the dragons escaping at the same time that that happened. I'd have to reread the chapter to see if there's any intentional correlation there. I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, but the Tyrion and Penny relationship obviously is very interesting. Pretty clear that, you know, Penny is serving as a character essentially to help Tyrion find his humanity in a way, also as a mirror to Tyrion because he's forced to think about dwarves and, and how crippled bastards and broken, broken things, if you will, uh, grow up. And he's, you know, it's, it shoves his privilege in his face because he realizes, you know, he could be doing something more like what Penny and Groat are doing if he wasn't a Lannister. So Penny is an interesting character, obviously a side character and an adjunct to Tyrion, um, uh, but but interesting in her own right. She has a pretty good story. In fact, maybe we should do a Penny character stream if you go all the way back to Game of Thrones. Um, we do find some interesting stuff about here. But yeah, the point of Penny in the story is... Because uh, because Tyrion is is close to turning into an absolute inhuman monster, uh, you know. Penny gives him someone to protect and to care about. Um, if you think about it, like, because Penny's young, she's she's I think she's twenty, so she's barely and she's been sheltered by her her father. So she, in many ways, Penny is is very childlike, and so this it triggers Tyrion to sort of act protectively and more responsibly. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's. I, I I think I don't think George is going to do something tragic to Penny. I think Penny will live. I could see her getting some sort of cute little ending. I don't think she'll marry Tyrion or anything like that. But um, yeah, I'm, I think we all are cheering for Penny for sure. Oh, the dwarves, Penny. That's funny. So when Tyrion charges attacks on the sex workers of King's Landing, it's called the dwarves, Penny. <laughs> Very good. Nice. I, I never uh, made that connection. Um, oh, is there a thing with all the coins, too? Of course, with the Taisha, the awful Taisha story, there's coins involved, right? Silver stag for every guardsman that rapes her, and Tyrion pays a golden coin. So maybe the idea is, like, false worth or something like that. Like, pennies, she's equated with the lowest coin, but she's actually valuable because she's a good person. Um, something like that. Uh, I don't know. I, I, we have to wait and see where all that Tyrion and Taisha stuff is going and how George is going to wrap that up. But it is interesting that Penny is named after a coin when the coins have been such uh, a, a strong theme of Tyrion's story. So if you guys, if you brilliant people in the chat or the comments have anything to add to that, please let me know. Cause I'm definitely interested to see where that goes. So Penny dropping a good line. Tyrion says he would sell his sister for a cup of wine. She's like, you'd sell your sister for a cup of horse piss. And then he says, is my taste for horse piss so well known or have you met my sister? And she says, I only saw her that one time when we jousted for the board. 
excuse me, the boy king, Grote thought she was beautiful. Grote was a stunted little lickspittle with a stupid name. Only a fool rides into battle sober. Plum will have some wine. What if he dies in this battle? It would be a crime to waste it. Hold your tongue. I need to lace this jerkin up. Tyrion did try, but it seemed to him that the sounds of slaughter were growing louder, and his tongue would not be held. Puddingface wants to use the company to throw the Iron Men back into the sea. He heard himself telling Penny, as she dressed him, what he should have done was send all his horses at the eunuchs, full charge, before they got ten feet from their gates. Send the cats at them from the left, us in the wind blown from the right, rip apart their flanks from both ends. Man to man, the Unsullied are no better or worse than any spearmen. It's their discipline that makes them dangerous. But if they cannot form up into a spear wall, lift your arms, said Penny. There, that's better. Maybe you should command the Yunkishmen. They use slave soldiers. Why not slave commanders? That would ruin the contest, though. This is just a Sivas game to the wise masters. We're the pieces. Tyrion canted his head to one side, considering. They have that in common with my lord father, these slavers. Your father? What do you mean? I was just recalling my first battle, the Green Fork. We fought between a river and a road. When I first saw my father's host deploy, I remember thinking how beautiful it was, like a flower opening its petals to the sun, a crimson rose with iron thorns. And my father, ah, he had never looked so resplendent. He wore crimson armor and this huge great cloak made from cloth of gold, a pair of golden lions on his shoulders, another on his helm. His stallion was magnificent. His lordship watched the whole battle from atop that horse and never got within a hundred yards of any foe. He never moved, never smiled, never broke a sweat, while thousands died below him. Picture me perched on a camp stool, gazing down upon a Sivas board. We could almost be twins. If I had a horse, some crimson armor, and a great cloak sewn from cloth of gold. He was taller, too. I have more hair. <clears throat> That's one of my favorite Tyrion monologues right there, by the way. <laughs> Just him comparing himself to to Tywin in this sort of bitter way. It's pretty good stuff. Um, and going back a, a minute, we remember that the plan for Barristan was to essentially create a bunch of confusion so that the Unsullied had time to form up into ranks outside the gates. And Barristan was observing that this was the most vulnerable point because until they form up, they're very, very vulnerable because they're a phalanx army and they have to get into ranks and lock shields to be effective. <clears throat> so T Tyrion is seeing the same thing on the other side. He's like, ah, if I was in charge, I would have attacked the Unsullied as soon as I saw them coming out of the gate because that's that's when we could have, you know, nipped them in the bud, if you will. Um, so we see the same strategy being evident to all the wise people on the battlefield, if you will. Penny is definitely not an agent of anyone. <laughs> Come on, guys. So um, he finishes off the monologue. He was taller too. I have more hair. Then it says, Penny kissed him. She moved so fast that he had no time to think. She darted in quick as a bird and pressed her lips to his. Just as quickly it was over. What was that for? He almost said, but he knew what it was for. Thank you, he might have said, but she might take that to leave as leave to do it again. Child, I have no wish to hurt you. He could have tried, but Penny was no child and his wishes would be would not blunt the cut. For the first time longer than he cared to think, Tyrion Lannister was at a loss for words. She looks so young, he thought. A girl, that's all she is. A girl and almost pretty if you can forget that she's a dwarf. Her hair was a warm brown, thick and curly, and her eyes were large and trusting, too trusting. Do you hear that sound, said Tyrion. She listened. What is it? She said as she was strapping a pair of mismatched greaves onto his stunted legs. <clears throat> War. On either side of us and not a league away. That's slaughter, Penny. That's men stumbling through the mud with their entrails hanging out. That's severed limbs and broken bones and pools of blood. You know how the worms come out after a hard rain? I hear they do the same after a big battle if enough blood soaks into the ground. That's the stranger coming, Penny. The black goat. The pale child. Him of many faces. Call him what you will. That's death. You're scaring me. Am I? Good. You should be scared. We have Ironborn swarming ashore and Sir Barristan and his unsullied pouring out of the city gates with us between them fighting on the wrong bloody side. I'm terrified myself. You say that, but you still make japes. Japes are one way to keep the fear away. 
Wine's another. You're brave. Little people can be brave. My giant of Lannister, he heard. She's mocking me. He almost slapped her again. His head was pounding. I never meant to make you angry, Penny said. Forgive me. I'm frightened is all. She touched his hand. Tyrion wrenched away from her. I'm frightened. Those were the same words Shay had used. Oh, sorry, it's in italic, so Tyrion doesn't say it. It's inner monologue. Yeah, I'm frightened. Those were the same words Shay had used. Her eyes were as big as eggs, and I had swallowed every bit of it. I knew what she was. I told Bronn to find a woman for me, and he brought me Shay. His hands curled into fists, and Shay's face swam before him, grinning. Then the chain was tightening about her throat, the golden hands digging deep into her flesh as her own hands fluttered against her face with all the force of butterflies. If he'd had a chain to hand, if he'd had a crossbow, a dagger, anything, he would have, he might have. <clears throat> it was only then that Tyrion heard the shouts. He was lost in a black rage, drowning in a sea of memory, but the shouting brought the world back in a rush. He opened his hands, took a breath, turned away from Penny. Something's happening. He went outside to discover what it was. Dragons. Let me get a drink here real quick. <clears throat> One second. So it's dragons, guys. The green beast was circling above the bay, banking and turning as longships and galleys clashed and burned below him. But it was the white dragon the cell swords were gawking at. 300 yards away, the wicked sister swung her arm, chunk, thump, and six fresh corpses went dancing through the sky. Up they rose, up and up. Then two burst into flame. The dragon caught one burning body just as it began to fall, crunching it between his jaws as pale fires ran across his teeth. White wings cracked against the morning air, and the beast began to climb again. The second corpse caromed off an outstretched claw and plunged straight down to land amongst some yunkish horsemen. Some of them caught fire too. One horse reared up and threw his rider. The others ran, trying to outrace the flames and fanning them instead. Tyrion Lannister could almost taste the panic as it rippled across the camps. So here we see the dragons coming into play here. It's pretty funny. Viserion caught one and tried to catch the other and missed. <laughs> so it just like went off his hand like a receiver dropping a pass. That's pretty funny. What's left news and analysis with Jon Snow? Sounds like a podcast. Says, I definitely see Danny losing a battle because her foe wipes out the unsullied before they're able to form up. Also, Penny is definitely a little finger agent. No, she's not a little finger agent, guys. <laughs> That's a good troll, but no, Penny's is as sincere as they come. And uh, yeah, so that could be foreshadowing, right? To this idea that, oh, you got to get the unsullied out and form up or else they could lose. I could see that, yeah, you know, not all of the soldiers and armies are going to survive to the end of the story. So that could be a way that Danny suffers a crushing defeat at some point, yeah. <clears throat> could see that. <laughs> How much did you pay her, raged Tyrion? Only a penny, replied Littlefinger. <laughs> <laughs> no guys no no <laughs> all right so Viserion is eating corpses and everyone is panicking Tyrion could almost taste the panic and it says the sharp familiar scent of urine filled the air the dwarf glanced about and was relieved to see that it was ink pots who had pissed himself not him <laughs> you had best go change your breeches Tyrion told him and whilst you're at it turn your cloak the, pay, the paymaster blanched, but did not move. He was still standing there, staring as the dragon snatched corpses from the air, when the messenger came pounding up. A bloody officer, T Tyrion saw at once. He was clad in golden armor and mounted on a golden horse. Loudly, he announced that he had come from the supreme commander of the young Kai, the noble and puissant Gorzak Zoiraz. Lord Gordazak sends his compliments to Captain Plum and requests that he bring his company to the bay shore. Our ships are under attack. 
your ships are sinking, burning, fleeing, thought Tyrion. Your ships are being taken, your men put to the sword. He was a Lannister of Casterly Rock, close by the Iron Islands. Ironborn reavers were no strangers to their shores. Over the centuries, they had burned Lannisport at least thrice and raided it two dozen times. Westerman knew, that Westerman knew what savagery the Ironborn were capable of. These slavers were just learning. Captain's not here just now, Inkpots told the messenger. He's gone to see the girl general. The rider pointed at the sun. Lady Malaza's command ended with the rising of the sun. Do as Lord Gorzak instructs you. <clears throat> Attack the squid ships, you mean? The ones out there in the water? The paymaster frowned. I don't see how myself, but when Brown Ben gets back, I'll tell him what your Gorzak wants. I gave you a command. You will act upon it now. We take commands from our captain, Inkpot said. I'm um, sorry. We take commands from our captain, Inkpot said in his usual mild tone. He's not here, I told you. The messenger had lost his patience, Tyrion could see. Battle is joined. Your commander should be with you. Might be, but he's not. The girl sent for him. He went. The messenger went purple. You must carry out your order. <clears throat> Snatch spat a wad of well-chewed sour leaf out of the left side of his mouth. Begging your pardon, he told the Yunkish rider, but we're all horsemen here, same as my lord. Now a good trained war horse, he'll charge a wall of spears. Some will leap a fire ditch, but I never once seen any horse could run on water. The ships are landing men, screamed the Yunkish lordling. They've blocked the mouth of the Skahazadam with a fire ship, and every moment you stand here talking, another hundred swords come splashing through the shallows. Assemble your men and drive them back into the sea at once. Gorzak commands it. Which one is Gorzak? asked Kem. Is he the rabbit? Pudding face, said Inkpots. The rabbit's not fool enough to send light horse against long ships. <clears throat> so I'll just remind you that all the various Yunkish slave soldier companies have eccentric leaders, such as Pudding Face, the rabbit, and so on. So that's, that's what we're dealing with here. The rider had heard enough. I shall inform Gorzak Zoeras that you refuse to carry out his order, he said stiffly. Then he wheeled his golden horse around and galloped back the way he'd come, chased by a gale of sellsword laughter. Inkpots was the first to let his smile die. Enough, he said, suddenly solemn. Back to it. Get the horses saddled. I want every man of you ready to ride when Ben gets back here with some proper orders. And put that cook fire out. You can break your fast after the fighting's done if you live that long. He gazed... His gaze fell on Tyrion. What are you grinning at? You look like a little fool in that armor, half-man. Better to look like a fool than to be one, the dwarf replied. We are on the losing side. The half-man's right, said Jor Mormont. We do not want to be fighting for the slavers when Daenerys returns, and she will make no mistake. Strike now and strike hard, and the queen will not forget it. Find her hostages and free them, and I will swear on the honor of my house and home that this was Brown Ben's plan from the beginning. <clears throat> so remember, Brown Ben was on Danny's side, and he turned cloak and joined the Yunkish slave uh, side when they looked like the better side. So Jorah is essentially saying that he will cover for Brown Ben and say that this was Brown Ben's plan to ally with the Yunkish and then sell them out right at the high point of the battle to help Daenerys. So pretty interesting. And guys, let me go grab the cockatoo. I should really start putting that pause in the middle of that word. And I should say, guys, let me go grab my cock, a, a two. One second. This also means that the cockatoo sunglasses ban will be in effect. <clears throat> uh, yes. Cleo likes to tear the sunglasses off my face. Uh, yeah, I won't pull a Tubin. Don't worry. Don't worry. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, Jeffrey Tubin. Okay, so Jorah makes his speech. They're trying to, obviously Jorah and Tyrion are both trying to get the second sons to switch sides. Uh, and it says, 
Out on the waters of Slaver's Bay, another of the Carthine galleys went up in a sudden whoosh of flame. Tyrion could hear elephants trumpeting to the east. The arms of the six sisters rose and fell, throwing corpses. Shield slammed against shield as two spear walls came together beneath the walls of Meereen. Dragons wheeled overhead, their shadows sweeping across upturned faces of friend and foe alike. Inkpots threw up his hands. I keep the books. I guard our gold. I draw up our agreements, collect our wages, make certain that we have sufficient coin to buy provisions. I do not decide who we fight or when. That is for Brown Ben to say. Take it up with him when he returns. By the time Plum and his companions came galloping back from the camp of the girl general, the white dragon had flown back to its lair above Mirene. The green still proud, soaring in wide circles above the city and the bay on great green wings. Brown Ben Plum wore plate and mail over boiled leather. The silk cloak flowing from his shoulders was his only concession to vanity. It rippled when he moved, the color changing from pale violet to deep purple. He swung down from his horse and gave her over to a groom, then told Snatch to summon his captains. Tell them to make haste, asked, added Casporio the Cunning. Tyrion was not even a sergeant, but their Sivas games had made him a familiar sight in Brown Ben's tent, and no one tried to stop him when he entered with the rest. Besides Casporio and Inkpots, Ulan and Bococo were amongst those summoned. The dwarf was surprised to see Jorah Mormont there as well. We are commanded to defend the wicked sister, Brown Ben informed them. The other men exchanged uneasy glances. No one seemed to want to speak until Sir Jorah asked, On whose authority? The girls. Sir Grandfather is making for the Harridan, but she's afraid he'll turn towards the wicked sister next. The ghost is already down. Marcellin's freedmen broke the long lances like a rotten stick and dragged it over with chains. The girl figures Selmy means to bring down all the trebuchets. Okay, so Marcellin's freedmen, that is one of... Mar the freedmen are some of the... Uh, the freed refugees from Astapor and Yunkai. That Danny, remember, Danny has a giant horde of refugees, essentially. Some of those people turned out to be fighters. And so Marcellin is the captain of the freedmen. Uh, so this is one of Barristan's forces. And we're now hearing that they broke the long lances, which is one of the Yunkish slave companies, and um, drag, dragged over. That means, okay, they flipped over one of the catapults, essentially. <clears throat> So it says, the girl figures sell me means to bring down all the trebuchets. It's what I do in his place, Sir Jorah said. Only I would have done it sooner. Why is that? So <laughs> Sir Jorah still carrying out his grudge against Barristan, you know, thinking that he would be a better advisor for Danny. So he's questioning. Of course, he has to question, even when he agrees with Barristan's strategies. Like, oh, I, I would have done it sooner. <laughs> so that's funny. And then it says, uh, why is the girl still giving orders, Ink Pots? Sounded baffled. Dawn has come and gone. Can she not see the sun? She's behaving as if she were still the supreme commander. If you were her and knew the pudding face was about to assume command, you might keep giving orders too, said Mormont. One is no better than the other, Casporio insisted. True, said Tyrion, but Malaza has the nicer teats. Crossbows is how you hold the wicked sister, Ink Pots said. Scorpions, mangonels, that's what's needed. Do not use mounted men to defend a fixed position. Does the girl mean for us to dismount? If so, why not use her spears or slingers? Kem struck his pale blonde head inside the tent. Sorry to disturb my lords, but another rider's come. Says he has new orders from the Supreme Commander. <clears throat> Brown Ben glanced at Tyrion, then shrugged. Send him in. Uh, let me pause here, actually. I've got a PayPal. And before we get this next part of the scene... Deborah says, you're awesome. Love your content. And thanks for the Red Hot Chili Peppers mini live show a few weeks back. You have great taste. Awesome. Yeah. We love the Chili Peppers around here. Thank you. <clears throat> so this, uh, the guy with um, another rider with orders from the Supreme Commander comes in. Brown Ben glanced at Tyrion, then shrugged. Send him in. In here, Kem asked, confused. Here is where I seem to be, Plum said with a trace of irritation. If he goes somewhere else, he will not find me. Out went Kem. When he returned, he held the tent flap open for a Yunkish nobleman in a cloak of yellow silk and matching pantaloons. The man's oily black hair had been tortured, twisted, and lacquered to make it seem as if a hundred tiny roses were sprouting from his head. 
On his breastplate was a scene of such delightful depravity that Tyrion sensed a kindred spirit. It's kind of funny, right? <clears throat> Let's see. Um, out went Kem. When he returned, he held the tent flap open. Oh, I just read that. Sorry. Um, okay. The Unsullied are advancing toward... Actually, no, I do want to make a point. So the Yonkish nobleman is all in yellow, but he has oily black hair that looks like a bunch of little roses. So do you remember earlier in the chapter when... Um, yes, yeah, see you later, Minty. When uh, Tyrion was talking about the battle of the Black... Not the Black Water, the Red Fork, and he said his father's army unfolded like an iron rose. So that... that un the... The moon has a flower symbolism. It ties into the moon blood and the idea of a woman flowering and all that stuff. However, um, we also see the roses, right? The bloody roses and the blue roses. So there's an entire line of flower symbolism that applies to the moon. And if you think about a flower opening its petals, it's basically a slow looking explosion. And you have to remember, if, if the moon exploded in the sky, it wouldn't look like the Death Star at the end of Star Wars. You'd see it crack, and then you'd see a black cloud like slowly expand from the moon. So it really would look like a flower sort of blooming, but it'd be a black flower. So that's why Martin talks about an iron rose, thorns gleaming. So think about moon meteor thorns and a black rose of darkness, okay? So here we have this solar Yunkish figure. Remember, they have golden armor, yellow silk, but his hair has all these oily black roses. So now we have the oily black stone, which is obviously a meteor symbol, if not actual meteor stone, tied into the black flower symbolism. And this is all on his head. So just like Drogo, the solar king, has oily black hair, same symbolism here. We have a solar, a yellow solar figure with black oily hair and those black roses. <clears throat> so... He says, the Unsullied are advancing towards the Harpy's daughter, the messenger announced. Bloodbeard and two Giscari legions stand against them. While they hold the line, you are to sweep around behind the eunuchs and take them in the rear, sparing none. This is by the command of the most noble and puissant Morgar Zozerin, supreme commander of the young Kai. <clears throat> Morgar, Kasporio frowned. No, Gorzak commands today. Gorzak Zoeraz lies slain, cut down by Pentoshi treachery. The turncloak, who names himself the Prince of Tatters, shall die screaming for this infamy, the noble Morgar swears. So remember, the, uh, the Tattered Prince was making deals with Quentin and later with Barristan. So we know he's on Barristan's side. So this makes sense. He's turned tail against the Yunkish, right? Hang on one second, guys. I gotta I gotta clear my throat real good here, uh, which means it's like 420. So one second. Let me put uh, let me put the art back up. I'll be a sport. One second. Yeah. Psh, psh, psh. Yeah. No co-host and no pre-recorded quotes. So bear with me one second. Be right with you. And we're back. All right. <clears throat> so Gorzak Zoeras cut down by Pentoshu treachery. So Brown Brown Ben has sprung his trap. He has struck down the noble Gorzak Zoeras. 
And so now Morgar is in charge. So uh, Brown Ben scratched at his beard. The windblown have gone over, have they? He said in a tone of mild interest. Tyrion chortled. And we've traded Pudding Face for the drunken conqueror. It's a wonder he was able to crawl out of the flagon long enough to give a halfway sensible command. The youngishman glared at the dwarf. Hold your tongue, you verminous little... His retort withered. This insolent dwarf is an escaped slave, he declared, shocked. He is the property of noble Yezin Kagas of hallowed memory. You are mistaken. He is my brother in arms, a free man and a second son. Yezin slaves wear golden collars. Brown Ben smiled his most amiable smile. Golden collars with little bells. Do you hear bells? I hear no bells. Collars can be removed. I demanded this dwarf be surrendered for punishment at once. That seems harsh. Jorah, what do you think? This. Mormont's longsword was in his hand. As the rider turned, Sword Jorah thrust it through his throat. The point came out the back of the Yunkishman's neck, red and wet. So here's the mythical astronomy. We've got the red sword of heroes. Okay, the sun is now dying, right? Blood bubbled from his lips and down his chin. The man took two wobbly steps and fell across the Sivas board, scattering the wooden armies everywhere. So this is the sun that has just fallen out of the sky. And of course, the moon meteors drank the fire of the sun. And when the meteors land, they're going to light up the sky like a second sun. That's right. And now is the time to pull up the sigil of the second suns. That's the whole point of the second sun symbolism. Um, it was two things. One, George is doing a lot with second sons, as in not the firstborn son, but the secondborn son. Uh, but also, every time there's a big fire, it says it was like a second sun. Hard home was like a second sun. When Watts Wood caught fire in uh, Duncan Egg, that was like a second sun, or like the sun rising in the west. So when the meteors fall at the end of Winds of Winter, it's going to be like a bunch of suns. Oh, yeah, there's a dragon fight when it says it looks like there's a thousand suns in the sky uh, because of all the balls of fire. So here we have this solar figure, again, with oily black hair. He's just been killed with Lightbringer, and he's now crashing down to the earth um, like a second sun, right? Killed by the second sun. So it's pretty good symbolism. And the second sun sigil, of course, as I was just alluding to, um, oh, the artwork is shitty for it. It's not really even artwork. Uh, it's a broken sword is the point. And of course, we know that um, Lightbringer was broken twice before the third successful forging. The last hero supposedly broke his sword against the others before he got Dragonsteel. Um, Waymar broke his sword. Barrack's flaming sword breaks. There's the whole idea of dawn breaking. So the idea of the broken sword is very important. It's a big Lightbringer symbol. And that is why we see the second sons with a broken sword. So we know that, you know, think of, think of basically moon meteors lighting up the sky like a second sun and think about Lightbringer as a broken sword, all tied together in this mythical astronomy symbolism. So the sun character takes two wobbly steps, falls across the Sivas board, scattering the wooden armies everywhere. He twitched a few more times, grasping the blade of Mormon's sword with one hand, as the other clawed feebly at the overturned table. Only then did the Yunkishman seem to realize he was dead. He lay face down on the carpet in a welter of red blood and oily black roses. So there you go. You've got... <laughs> oh, even more. Sword Jorah wrenched his sword free of the dead man's neck. Blood ran down its fullers. So there's Lightbringer, the red sword. It's literally pulled out of a moon meteor after it landed because this... That's what happened, essentially. This solar figure turned into a moon meteor. So he's made of red blood and oily black roses. That gives you, again, the black rose moon explosion symbol. It gives you the oily black stone symbol. Uh, the bleed, Of course, the meteors are bleeding stars. So we've got a welter of red blood. If you think about a flood of meteors in the sky, it's basically like a bunch of bleeding stars, a blood flood, moon blood flood. You know, it's, it's all there. So... Um, yeah, this is a, 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 and it's scattering the armies, uh, and 
Then it gets even better. Check this out. The white Sivas dragon ended up at Tyrion's feet. He scooped it off the carpet and wiped it on his sleeve, but some of the yunkish blood had collected in the fine grooves of the carving, so the pale wood seemed veined with red. Okay, so this is one of the most outstanding symbols in all of A Song of Ice and Fire, it, especially towards the latter chapters, okay? So think about this. The, the pieces are wood. They're made of pale wood. So we've got a white wooden piece that's now drinking blood, drinking the blood of Azor Ahai, okay? Because that's what the, that's the solar king who dies. That's Azor Ahai. So he is going into the Weirwood Net. This is Azor the High, the dragon, going into the Weirwood Net. You've got a wooden, a pale wooden tree stand in, veined with red blood. It drinks the blood, and it's also a dragon. So this, this is the same symbol as Blood Raven, right? Blood Raven sigil is a white dragon. He is an albino Targaryen, a white dragon. He is a bloody white dragon because he's Blood Raven. And then he goes into the Weirwood. He's, his spirit is inside the Weirwood. So here we have the solar figure, the Azor High stand-in, Lightbringers forged. He goes into the Weirwood. It's a dragon inside the Pale Wood. So it's this is like very strong Azor High in the Weirwood symbolism. What does What is said right after that? So the Pale Wood seemed veined with red. Then Tyrion says, All hail our beloved Queen Daenerys. Be she alive or she dead. He tossed the bloody dragon in the air, caught it, grinning. We have always been the queen's men, announced Brown Ben Plum. Rejoining the young Kai was just a plot. And what a clever ploy it was. Tyrion gave the dead man a shove with his boot. If that breastplate fits, I want it. So that's cool. So remember the breastplate had scenes of debauchery. And Tyrion's like, ah, oh, that's a nice breastplate. <laughs> kind of like uh, Terminator 2 looking at the cop saying, that's a nice bike. And then next scene, he's, he's riding the bike and the cop is dead. So uh, there you go. He's collected the uh, the naughty breastplate. But it's cool. So right after this symbol of Azor High going into the Weirwood Net, Tyrion says, all hail our beloved Queen Daenerys. So that could be something about Nissa Nissa, or it could be Azor High Reborn, because Daenerys plays the role of both. But I think this is a Nissa Nissa thing, because she's missing. And he's saying, is you know, she may be alive or dead. We don't know. She's the truth is she's in the weirwood net. That's where she goes when she dies. So, uh, and then of course also Tyrion tossing the white dragon piece in the air and catching it and talking about Daenerys kind of implies that maybe Tyrion will get to ride Viserion, right? I mean that's <laughs> that's the more obvious foreshadowing that's going on here. So. For those of you who want Tyrion to ride a dragon, whether or not he is a Targaryen, this is definitely some Viserion foreshadowing, potentially. Very cool. So, and that's the end of the chapter. Tyrion won. Uh, the Winds of Winter. <laughs> it was a Winds of Winter chapter. So, pretty cool stuff. Um this is showing you how the battle's about to turn. Like we can really see how the rest of it's going to go. Barristan's attack is doing well. The Unsullied have successfully formed up. Uh, one of the catapults is being flipped. The dragons are flying and people are starting to panic. The second suns are turning. The tattered prince has turned the wind blown. And uh, pretty much they're toast. Um, the Yunkish are toast. And then the Ironborn are attacking out in the bay. So this whole battle has changed. It's basically going to be a rout. But here's the thing. The people inside the city that are holding the city are of dubious loyalty. So there is a possibility that Danny's forces out in the field will be, will be successful. And then essentially the Harpy faction inside Marine will shut the gates to them and they'll be caught outside the city. So there is... I think that's how this is going to go, essentially, is that we're going to see a, a good victory forming up, but then we're going to see some treachery on Danny's side as well that's going to cause some complexity. But it could be that they'll just sail to victory, and then the complexity will come when Victarion comes ashore and starts talking to Barristan 
and the other powers of Marine, and they start trying to negotiate power. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen there at all. So, guys, let's uh, let's open it up to speculation about how this is going to go. What's going to happen next? What is going to happen um, when Victarion, like I said, comes ashore? When Tyrion, when this battle is won, and Tyrion and Barristan meet. Uh, it's going to be, that will be Jorah and Barristan also meeting again because, you know, Jorah's hanging out there. So how's Jorah going to be dealt with? There's definitely a lot of questions here about how this is going to go. Hey, good girl. Do you think Dario will survive? Would the Yankish Azor High guys kill blue-haired Dario? So Dario... Thing about Dario is that he used to be all blue, but then he switched. He switched to purple, purple and gold. So now he looks like a lost dragon lord. Daenerys observes. So he's his symbolism is interesting. It's kind of got a little bit of ice and fire going on. It's similar to Young Griff symbolism or Jon Snow symbolism. So yeah, I, I don't think Dario is done. He's definitely going to get loose and. Uh, He's got to get those weapons going, man. I, I want Dario to wreak some war and woe. We got to get some more war and woe from Dario, right? Hey, don't bite that. So I definitely don't think he's done. Dario's not dead. Don't say that. Killing me. Dario and Penny, rule Marine at the end. <clears throat> Here's my prediction. Oops, oh, uh, I was trying to highlight this one. I really want Barristan to make it back home before he dies. Yeah, well, the thing is that he doesn't really, I mean, home is Westeros, but he doesn't really have a home. Like, they give him a castle to die in quote unquote, he's not stoked on it. So he has no connection to, um, to anything but duty really. And the King and the queen and his whole Kingsguard identity. So I think the question with, with Barry, as we talked about in the Barristan stream is when he hears about Fagon, how will that affect his loyalties? How soon will Danny come back? What kind of stories will be told about Danny? So, uh, there we go. Talk studios. Dario just carries Penny around on his shoulders. That's awesome. Love it. I think Dario would be super nice to Penny, actually. I can totally see that working. Not as a romance, just as like a weird friendship. <laughs> so I actually don't think the Ironborn are dropping Danny off in King's Landing. Um, I think the Ironborn will be taking Danny back to Old Town, where Euron is potentially. Uh, I think, I think that whole thing about in the show where she lands on Dragonstone. I don't know about that. Um, I think she'll come to Old Town, and I think here she'll be imitating the Bloodstone Emperor uh, Azor Ahai, who seems to have come to Westeros at Old Town. I think Euron will be declaring himself king from Old Town. Uh, so it depends on. Danny's going to be making a deal with Victoriani, and we don't know what kind of deal Victorian is going to try to make. Is Victorian going to stick with the idea that he's making an alliance for Euron and then give himself time to like win Danny over and then pull the rug out from under Euron? Or is he just going to show up and say, I'm the king of the Ironborn, you know, fuck my brother and, uh, or don't fuck my brother rather. <laughs> um, I'm the king of the Ironborn and you should marry me. Uh, we don't know when, Euron might spring his trap. I think Euron's going to stay in Old Town, but he could show up in Slaver's Bay. We don't know. Or he could have agents in Slaver's Bay. He has, I think Euron's got a glass candle, so maybe he'll torment Victarion in dreams or something. Um, anything's, anything's possible there, but we don't know when Euron is going to try to pull the rug out from under Vic. I think Euron will let Vic take Danny back to Westeros, maybe even let Victarion think that he's gotten one over and then he'll do it, you know, in the most lazy and convenient way possible, which is let Danny be brought all the way to him and then try 
to pull the rug out from under Victorian with a Kraken that he summons in the harbor to bring a ship down. I don't know. I'm not sure. <clears throat> so Talk Studios is saying, if the Harpies take the city after Tyrion wins the battle, the Danny could have a reason to attack the city with her dragon. She could. Yep. Because that would accomplish the goal of kind of getting all the people we care about or most of them out of the city. Uh, similarly to Volantis talked about this in the winds of winter Volantis preview, but it's heavily foreshadowed that Danny's going to burn Volantis and that there is a slave revolt brewing to help her. Remember the Roloris are whipping up everybody against the old blood of Volantis uh, that lives inside the few stone black walls, the old city. So Volantis is already, they already segregate all the people we want to kill inside their, inside their central city. So really all that's needed is for all the slaves that serve the old blood to kind of sneak out the side door all at the same time. Um, and this is exactly what the widow of the waterfront and the, the, the Reloris are probably setting up. So I think we're going to see something similar in Volantis where George maneuvers it so that the innocents essentially are moved out of the way and Danny can bring fire and blood, burn a city down, but it's mostly going to be a good thing. <clears throat> we could see something similar in Marine, possibly. We will see. But um, if they trap, it could also be like they're winning the battle, but they need to flee back into the gates. And then if the Harpies and the Marine faction closes the gates, maybe it leads to a slaughter of Danny's allies or something like that. That could happen, too. Will Tyrion eventually betray Daenerys? That's a good question. It could happen. We don't know what Tyrion's loyalties are, really. He doesn't know what they are either. <clears throat> He's motivated by revenge a lot right now, and that's kind of like suspect as a motivation. Um, so I think that him and Danny will make good allies. They might be friends, or Tyrion might just see Danny as a good ruler. Because when, when Tyrion was in King's Landing, he was trying to sort of keep the peace and do a good job. There is a good heart in down in there somewhere with Tyrion. So perhaps he's able to rediscover that. Maybe Danny restores his faith a little bit. Um, but he definitely could betray her for any reason. Uh, absolutely. That's, that's definitely in play. No question. Yeah, I think he will gain her respect and become a general. And that was foreshadowed in this chapter, wasn't it? When Penny's like, you should be leading the army. Obviously, Tyrion would make a good general. And Tyrion compared himself to Tywin in this chapter, too. What will happen to the dragons when Victarion blows the horn? That is a good question. That is a very, very good question. Will they come to the horn? Will, will Victarion be considered the horn's master? Or is that Euron? Will Victarion just fly back to Old Town when that happens? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. We, we really don't know. But something will happen. And that is a good, you're, you're right to raise it. Like the Dragonbinder horn is about to be blown. And that definitely could do something and change the battle one way or the other. <clears throat> Danny attacking the city wouldn't break Tyrion's trust if because Tyrion would be part of Danny's allies who are being shut out of the city. So I don't think that would. That's the only way Danny's attacking the city is if they turn on her soldiers, essentially. <clears throat> what about Tyrion saying there are probably rare dragon scrolls in the Volantis library? Well, perhaps somebody could visit that library and steal some books. But I think... George has a few places that he can supply the needed dragon lore. There's a few old books running around, so it doesn't have to be the Volantis books. Mm -mm. Oh, that's that's actually a funny wordplay. So there, there is a Kraken horn, a horn that calls Krakens. 
but the Sam, the horn that Sam has, has a crack in it. So it's a, there's a crack in horn. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, Swagger Dagger is asking about Jorah. So I think Jorah's definitely going to take out his anger on some people. <laughs> that seems clear. He was the first one to stab the emissary in the tent there. So he's ready to kill some people. Um, probably, a, I, I think Jorah's about set to start on some kind of redemption slash rehabilitation arc. Uh, you know, I, I expect that he'll, his fighting in the battle and his helping the second sons, he's definitely going to try to get back in with Danny's good graces. He probably will. I don't think it'll be as happy feely as in the show where like, Oh, all is forgiven. But bottom line, Danny, it was hard for Danny to send Jorah away. And she was looking for a way to keep him, except for that Jorah was essentially just too, he didn't play it right. He said the wrong things. Oh, the sun's coming in here. Um, he acted arrogant. He wasn't apologetic. And so she had no choice, essentially. So there's definitely room for Danny to forgive Jorah. And uh, yeah, he's, he's living his karma as a slave. There's no doubt. So perhaps at a certain point, he will have been punished enough. Because I do think Jorah's going to end up back in Westeros, fighting with John, getting Longclaw back when John gets Dawn. That's kind of how I think all that's going. Girl, what are you doing? Okay, you're on the microphone. That's that should be fine. <clears throat> I do think one thing that I um let me highlight this comment. Where is it? Mm, I lost it. Sorry. Um, so Tyrion, like we've talked on this channel a lot about Danny and the idea of, you know, is she going to go mad like the books? Obviously, I don't think she is. There's a question of how dark a path she will walk in the remaining books. <clears throat> so I definitely think that Tyrion, uh, that Danny will gain the reputation of the Mad Queen's daughter and that that will be used against her at a certain point. Uh, it could also be, though, that Tyrion, who is more ruthless than Danny, ends up doing something uh, morally questionable in Danny's service, and that this is why Danny is labeled, you know, insane or a butcher or something like that. So Tyrion's going to be a good ally for Danny, but his his rage and anger and darkness could surface. And he could end up doing something that, like I said, sullies Danny's honor, changes the way that people look at her as well. <clears throat> yeah, she's not going to burn King's Landing to the ground. Um, King's Landing is going to be well destroyed before she gets there, first of all, because Fagon is going to try to take the city from Cersei. And I think Cersei is going to be setting off some wildfire and blowing up some shit, too. And it's going to be going through a whole war. So even though Fagon will be the Mummer's Dragon and he'll be cheered by the crowds, King's Landing will already be hurting by the time Danny lands and then tries to take it from Fagon. So there will be a series of disasters. And Danny's obviously not going to just burn the city. She wants to rule the city. And she wants to... Like, this is the part that didn't make sense about the show. Danny has been thinking about Westeros as her people and her land the whole time. And so when she gets there to rule them, it just doesn't make any sense to fly around and just burn people indiscriminately. Like, that's insane. It's not something that Danny would do morally, and it doesn't make any strategic sense either. So it was just a really dumb plot point. I just want to say this clearly. It's a fucking stupid-ass idea that Dave and Dan had because they wanted to turn Danny into a monster and they're cynical fucks who don't think that anybody who tries to improve the world can never actually succeed. And so they wanted to tell the story of, of course, the person who was trying to save everyone, of course they turned into a monster because that's what happens. Hitler started off just like Martin Luther King and then he ended up Hitler. That's how it happens. <clears throat> they're just terrible writers. That's the bottom line is they're terrible writers. It didn't make any sense for her character. Didn't make strategic sense. 
And it's not going to happen in the books for those reasons, because George is a good writer and because he's established the character of Daenerys to be the most empathetic, self-sacrificing character in the whole books who cares the most about her people. So the fact that she's looking at King's Landing's people as her people means that she's not going to go and, and it was, oh, she put the masters on a cross. Yeah, the slave masters of Meereen. I would pound those nails in too. And if you wouldn't, then I don't, I don't know where you're coming from unless you're just against capital. I guess I wouldn't crucify somebody, but you get, get the point. Like they're slave masters. Crucifying slave masters does not foreshadow killing innocent people. There's no connection between those things at all. It's the worst point that people always try to make. I'm not actually angry. I'm just trying to be entertaining. <laughs> <clears throat> But seriously, folks, what's what is here's what is foreshadowed. What's foreshadowed is that Danny is going to try to take King's Landing because that's her goal. That's what she thinks her goal is. It's actually Viserys' goal that she's adopted. She's going to have to see through that because the real her real purpose is obviously to fight the others with dragons. But she thinks she wants to take King's Landing. So she's going to try to take King's Landing. Some of that wildfire is going to get set off, or there'll just be more casualties than we expect. This is going to break Danny's heart. This is going to cause her to stare in the mirror. She's going to, it's going to be more of that shit about, oh, what have I done? I've leased dragons on the world. Maybe I am a monster. Oh God. Oh God. Because she's a self-aware person who questions themselves, unlike sociopathic, you know, psycho killers or whatever. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Um, so <clears throat> I expect this is going to be used. And I, this seems to me, may make so much sense to me that this is going to be used as Danny's turning point. That's going to make her pivot from letting go of the iron throne and heading North to fight the others somewhere in between seeing the casualties of using dragons in warfare and hearing about the threat of the others from Jon Snow. She's going to do what Stannis did. And this is the foreshadowing Stannis attacked King's Landing failed thought about going back and then decided to go North to, to, take care of the real problem instead. That's exactly what Danny's going to do. So anyways, no, she did not also crucify anti-slavery masters. I have no idea where you got that idea. Come here, girl. <clears throat> she crucified slave masters, not even all of them. There was, there was a bunch more. So don't start talking about Hitler either. Okay, please, please. Can we not? Dragon Hitler is what they tried to turn Danny into. That doesn't mean we need to talk about actual Hitler. Thank you. <laughs> Use our common sense, people. <clears throat> <clears throat> what we're supposed to see, and I, you know, I've covered this a bunch of times, but we're given two heroic ideals in A Song of Ice and Fire. There are the is there is the Azor Ahai heroic ideal, the person who is willing to do horrible things because it's somehow necessary. I've got to murder my wife, maybe break the moon, work blood magic to save the day. This is what Melisandre wants Stannis to do. Sacrifice Edric Storm to wake a dragon to fight the others because that will save everybody. But this is no, this is not the way. <laughs> this is not the way. Um, and that's the whole point of Davos saying like, you know, one child's life is worth the kingdom, in fact. Because if we... If we go against that, then they were, um, <clears throat> if they go against that, then they've essentially become the monster that they want to defeat. That's the point. So the real heroic ideal is actually the one expressed by Nissa Nissa, somebody who's willing to lay their life on the line, sacrifice themselves for others. So when we look at John and when we look at Danny, um, they both are those kinds of leaders who sacrifice themselves. They lay themselves on the line. They lead from the front. Um, John puts himself in danger all the time. He does the right thing and then puts himself in jeopardy. And not that that's all perfect strategy. John made some mistakes, obviously. <clears throat> but the point is, John, he goes to bat for the wildlings against the Night's Watchmen who don't trust him. Like, he sticks up for what's right. He puts himself in harm's way he's ready to lead the ranging to hard home until he realizes he needs to go to Winterfell. Same thing, same thing from, uh, with Danny, you know, she's, she risks her entire dream of going back to Westeros time and time again to do the right thing in Meereen and Slaver's Bay. So, 
there we go. Um, that's uh, my feelings about that. <clears throat> and I got a couple PayPal's. Dan Christensen says, great content, die a hero or live long enough to become the villain, right? That's exactly what I was, that's the phrase I was trying to get to. That's it. Um, and that's pretty strong theme in Song of Ice and Fire. That's why it's Davos's POV that we hear um, the, the Lightbringer myth from. Because we, George wants us to hear Davos's reaction to the Lightbringer myth. They go together. Oh, this glorious guy, Azor High, and did this horrible thing, and he forged Lightbringer and saved the day. And then Davos is like, Ugh, I don't know if I could do that. That's kind of messed up. So we're supposed to think about that. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, not an accident. <clears throat> yes, nuance. Nuance is something that George likes and that Dave and Dan did not like. Lauren Griffin was cheering me on as on my soapbox. That's cool. <clears throat> you know it. You know it. Hey, girl. Hi, Cleo. So I'll go ahead and take last call for questions and super chats and PayPal's. We are pretty much wrapped up. There's not a ton more to say here, so. I will just allow you to pepper me with questions if you would like. <laughs> Anti-slave anti-slavery slave masters seems like the type of propaganda that the slave masters would promulgate. Yeah, that's a good point. Can't really be an anti-slave master slave master now, can you? Yeah. Mm. Curious to see how the Dothraki and Danny's storyline will play out. Yeah, so again, check out our Winds of Winter preview series where we discussed that. But essentially, I think that Danny's going to take control of the Dothraki, not unlike what we saw on the show. I do expect her to kill a few cows, maybe not all at once in a burning building, but definitely going to take over the Dothraki. Her and Drogon are going to fly to the top of the Mother of the Mountains, Mother of Mountains, where only the calls are supposed to go. That's heavily foreshadowed. Drogon will become the stallion who mounts the world. Danny will essentially shatter Dothraki tradition and she will lead the crones of the Dosh Kaleen out of Vase Dothrak for the first time ever. And I believe they will be part of the force that helps stabilize Meereen. That is the idea that we came up with, Quinn and I. <laughs> Call killer. Yeah, I really did like that scene in the show, by the way, when she burnt them all in the, uh, in the hut there. I, th I thought that was... Very consistent with Danny. I, that was that was sick. I love that scene. Even though probably we won't get that exact scene in in the in the books. It's, I think it's, you know, that is something they came up with on the show. But we'll get something similar. Probably Drogon will be involved. Will Tyrion forgive his siblings? Not Cersei, surely. Uh, Jaime and Tyrion could reconcile, but. I don't know if they really need to. I feel like their stories have gone separate places. <clears throat> uh, Talk Studios is asking about the parallels between Danny's sickness and the fireworms that Araya had. I don't see any parallels there. The symptoms aren't similar, and there's Danny hasn't been anywhere to catch fireworms. So I don't I don't think that's where that's going at all. Although, if you want me to talk about fireworms, check out Great Empire of the Dawn Dracomorph stream, where I went way deep on the fireworms and all that stuff. Megan is pointing out uh, the idea that some of the masters weren't bad. Um, it comes from the show, where his dar tells Danny his father was against the crucifying the slave children of Irene. Yeah, that is not in the books. Um and I don't think it matters if he was against it. If he was participating in the system, then, you know, he's going to go down with the system. That's that's just how that works. <clears throat> cool. Well, it looks like I have answered your questions. Uh, well, so what am I working on next? <clears throat> I've actually just wrote uh, a new version of my... Prime Moon Meteor Theory. 
Uh, I haven't updated that one in a long time. People, I refer to moon meteors all the time and like as an aside in all my new videos, but I haven't actually talked about the actual theory since my first video ever, which is a little bit rough, you know, I was new. And then also my Con of Thrones uh, talk from a couple years ago, three years ago now. So I've got an hour long moon meteor, long night, red comet spectacular. It's gonna combine the original long night ideas with the idea that there'll be a comet coming back around to cause the new long night. So that will either be next or I might do the uh, secrets of the shadow binders and relorists Melisandre video, which I also have scripted. So it's just a question of which one I will record first. <clears throat> so I've got some pretty good stuff coming, essentially. Two of my most important videos. The Shadowbinders Reloris videos is going to blow you away. I've got some new ideas about that magic and how magic works in A Song of Ice and Fire. So we're going to take apart Shadowbinding and try to figure out exactly what it is. And I'm looking forward to that one. I'm waiting for the new uh, Unseen Westeros art to be ready so we can do that. And then, of course, you know I'm excited for the updated Moon Meteors theory. Completely written, rewritten, uh, taking a different logical tact with it. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. But I know some of you guys are new to the channel and want to know what all the Moon Meteor shit is about. So I'm going to tell you. It's good stuff. So thanks for all the encouragement, guys. Thanks for liking the video. Thanks for leaving a comment on your way out. And I will definitely be seeing you next week with a live stream. Uh, probably another Winds of Winter, but who knows? Maybe I'll be inspired to do something else. As you guys know, I'm very, I just follow my inspiration. So I never know what I'm going to do. There you go. <clears throat> Matt Vader, you are not blocked. I can see your comment, buddy. All right, guys. So have a great Monday. And uh, I'll talk to you again.